So we had the SID Display Week, and the, who are you? Uh, Roger Stewart. So what do you do? Uh, a designer of, of liquid crystal displays, uh, and, and a kind of an amateur historian as to what, what happened in the industry. Uh, so I think it's been exciting. We've gone from primitive devices back in the uh, 1970s and 80s, and now I think we're on the verge of making the perfect displays, the uh, Dolby Vision displays, which are, can show everything the eye can see. So, And that's LCD, all that? It's all LCD, yes. So why LCD? Why, why has LCD won this, this war? Or uh, how, how did LCD manage all these years? Uh, LCD, is, 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 that's a chemistry, but it's also electronics. There's an active uh, transistor at every pixel, and that improves the quality immensely. And so, um, so it's, it's been a revolution, and it's been fun to be part of it. Everyone, everyone owns one in their house, so it's, it's kind, of, kind of fun to help develop something which everyone knows about and has. So which part did you develop? What uh, did you do? I developed the, uh, um, the, well, the devices, the amorphous silicon, polysilicon devices. And uh, the one thing I did uh, individually um, run, run, won awards for was developing the electronics that go around the edge of the display to scan it. To scan it? To, in other words, you have, if you're going to have transistors, if you need them inside the display, once you have transistors, then it's very helpful to use the same transistors on the edge of the display to get rid of all the uh, electronics that you'd otherwise spend money on. So you get a, you get a smaller, a, ni a nice, if you look at the new displays, they have a very narrow edge. The, the plate is almost all display. If you look at them from 20 years ago, they used to have a big mullion on the edge, which was useless, and now that's gone. But so what you did help to have smaller bar bezels, or uh, it was bigger bezels in the past because there was a whole bunch of electronics? There are electronics in there, and so what's happened, we've eliminated all those electronics, and now we have, we filled the entire plate with a uh, display surface. And so um, uh, you, you're talking about a chart. Uh, what does that chart show? What does it talk about? The history of the LCD? Yes. Because uh, tomorrow is going to be 50 years? Yes, it is. And that's 50 years of history of, of uh, liquid crystal displays. And this was also a 50-year history of the society itself, of the Society of Information Display. That started with the LCD? And, and kind of like the, same time. the society began earlier. It was cathode ray tubes, the old tube television. Uh, but we're having another anniversary tomorrow, and I'll be there. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Uh, but the uh, liquid crystals are now that are not that age. And I did a history of of what's happened to liquid crystals over the last 50 years. So without, I don't want to take too much of your time, right? Because maybe you uh, you have to go. But like, is it possible to? to try to explain what happened, like who started, who were the, like some of the important part, bits on the chart, like uh, that leads to, or is it too much to Well, I'll give you a short version. Yeah? The, 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 the founder of Liquid Crystal Television was George Heilmeyer, who preceded me at RCA Laboratories. So I heard about him, I never really got to work with him, uh, but he was the inventor of Liquid Crystal Television. And it, it, uh, it proceeded. I mean, people had uh, uh, the calculators were all done with just with liquid crystal. No, no fancy electronics or anything, just using liquid crystals. But you couldn't, you couldn't do color. You couldn't scale it to make it high resolution. The bigger you made it, the lower the quality was. So the problem was chemists were trying to work on making the materials better. And then people like myself, who were the electronics guys, were trying to say, okay, we're going to use electronics to fix the problems in the chemistry. And so our solution was horribly expensive. Uh, and there was a big argument for about 10 years. And we eventually won. Quality of the display was more important than cost. So horribly expensive in the beginning. But the price got down when, uh, with like kind of like Moore's law, when the stuff electronics gets cheaper. It did, but the problem was Moore's law was easy because you just need to make more transistors for the same money. 
uh, but, but you did that by making them smaller. In this case, we had to take the integrated circuit technology and make it huge. We had to make the, these dis displays instead of small little integrated circuits. We had to make displays, which can be 10 feet by 8 feet in size. And so we built the world, we had to build a whole new technology, whole new factories in order to make these crazy transistors. And this is why the chemists didn't want to go that way. But the electrical engineers won out and, and we did solve those problems. The, the new factories cost $5 billion each, uh, but they work. Why did you build them? Because it produces a much better quality display. In but the, but where, where did you build them? Uh, we uh, built some smaller ones in the United States, but most of them now are in Japan or Korea or in, in uh, Taiwan. Were they the first ones to invest the $5 billion required to make a big factory? Yes. So they put the money and they saw the potential and they say, okay, let's put $5 billion. That's right. They had what they call patient capital. Japan was the first country that did that. The, the Americans were trying to make 30% return on investment, whereas the Japanese were willing to build a factory for 5% five, five return on investment, ROI. And wait 10 years to get the money back, it would be fine. In something. a way, they didn't care. They, wanted, they didn't care just about money. They cared about becoming the dominant, winning, becoming a leader. And so Japan was a winner. But in the end, Japan was pushed out, ironically, by Korea who has long been a rival of, of, of Japan, all the way back to the World War II. And so the Koreans enjoyed competing with Japan and taking away market share. So now Japan only has maybe 5% market share and Korea has 40% market share. Was it some, is it, has it got something to do with the cheaper labor and you come in and you have cheaper labor and then the, now China's coming with cheaper labor and they want to take it over from Korea. Or is it not to do with that? It, the factories are so expensive, the labor hardly matters. The, when you're spending $5 billion on a factory and you're only going to have 100 employees in it, it really doesn't, you're, what you really want is the factory to run well. And, and so it's a very hard, the, the Japanese were good, the Koreans were better, and then now it looks like the uh, uh, mainland China is going to give them all a run for the money. Mainland China is trying very hard to dominate this industry. It's $120 billion a year. Because everybody, uh, like uh, the uh, USA, Japan, Korea, and China, everybody has $5 billion now. So how, how do you figure out who's the best at investing it? And, or It's not just money. You have to have a culture. You have to have, uh, you have a whole infrastructure. And the, it's estimated now to enter the, enter the business, you'd have to spend $50 billion and lose money for the first 10 years. And so, so uh, Japan was willing to do that. Korea was willing to do that. Taiwan was willing to do that. And now mainland China is willing to do it. And, and they, they, wanna, they wanna be the leaders in the world. It's not just money. They, there's passion there. So you were the a RCA? I was with RCA. And RCA has a very long history in making TVs, right? Since, what was it? It was a CRT TVs before? Yes. And then they wanted to get into <coughs> LCD? I mean, they, they did, you did? We tried. You tried. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, but there's so many like uh, words that go together with LCD. People talk about uh, Active Matrix, active TFT, matrix. all this stuff. Yes. Who did all this? The Active Matrix, that's the electronics part. Active Matrix that's what means did. that's the transistor. So you, that's what we did. We did added that. the transistor, yes. Active Matrix. And then uh, everybody's using that. Yes. Every LCD is Active Matrix. Yes. Since long time. 20 years. Since 20, the last 20 years. And uh, what is this TFT? Who did that? That's the, the type of the active matrix, the transistor, is called a thin film transistor. And so that was, my, that was my area of expertise. I, I was interested in solid state physics, and I became an expert in, in, in odd transistors. And these thin film transistors are really the worst transistors you could ever imagine. The worst? The worst. They're terrible. 
They're the worst transistors ever invented by mankind or humankind or whatever. They're terrible, but they're cheap. And the key thing was to take a technology, we had to find a way to make these at a, at a thousand times cheaper than they were made before. And so we, we had to, and that, that was my expertise. I became an expert at designing circuits with the worst transistors in the world. For experts in lowering, the, yeah, I'm sure you saw some very expensive prototypes, right? In, oh, yes. in all these places. Transistors, prototypes cost a fortune. Like millions of dollars. Yes. More than a house. Yes. And, and you had to bring it down to thousands. Yes. That was your job. And we had to, and we had to, and we had to make electronics sophisticated electronics with transistors that any self-respecting designer would, would say is impossible. So I was specialized all my life in doing the impossible. So my expertise was to take transistors that were so bad no one felt they could do anything with them and find a way to do circuit design with them. So it's got to be pretty awesome, right? The people say it's impossible and you just make it happen? They, they paid me, they paid me, uh, I had a contract with, with the French for $8 million dollars, and they paid me for, for five years to do this, and they fed me well, French eat well. Which and, French? Uh, Thompson Grand Public. Thompson and RCA kind of like uh, the, the brand, or they, they kind of are together, right? Uh, uh, yes, RCA was sold to Thompson. Sold to Thompson. And so they're a French company that, that also made televisions. And so they, they kind of um, <clears throat> brought some people into their company uh, to help them with design and research and development. And that's what I did. And there's a laboratory somewhere? You sit down, you do these things? My laboratory was in Princeton, New Jersey, which was, that's the historical site of the RCA laboratories. That's where David Sarnoff himself founded that laboratory. So I, I love that laboratory, and we did a lot of good work there. Is that where you're from also? Uh, yes. And uh, was it nice colleagues, uh, all these people you worked on these things Wonderful with? colleagues. Very good environment, and, and I was... Uh, Thompson gave me enough money I could build my own uh, laboratory to work for Thompson and so I hired creative people and and uh, I was good at managing creative people in fact people would say all the time that this is impossible and I had a rule that says you're not allowed if you're in my laboratory you're not allowed to say it's impossible unless we have a party first a party party always had had a party like just party That's right. We would take everybody out of, away from the office and we'd go to a motel and we would uh, take, pick half a dozen of the most creative engineers I could find and we would get away from the office and we would uh, brainstorm about how to solve this problem. And I did it typically once every six months I would have insist on a party. And every time I did, I was able to find not just one, but typically three or four solutions to any problem they brought up. So we became very good at solving problems that no one else could solve. And so that's how I built my laboratory. How do you build a laboratory? There's a lot of cool tools in the laboratory. But mainly it was people. I, Just people? I, I, like office there's desks? Like it, it looks like a normal office? Yeah, it did. But, but, but we hired... Sarnoff was a wonderful place to work. And, and uh, I was privileged to be able to pay people decent salaries and we had hired people from all over the world and uh, and again I knew how to manage creativity uh, I, I was taught I was taught that in my work at Westinghouse so I learned how to how to run a, a creative operation I, I personally have 130 personal patents so I'm a very prolific inventor myself and within my laboratory we had many many more so we were very good inventors so is a lot of the business model is uh, to get the idea to make it work and then uh, license it to many different companies or it was all about using in this in, within the Thompson RCA Westinghouse brands and that's it. My goal there was just to make Thompson Grand Public successful. They were they were treating me very well. They 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 funded my laboratory for 10 years uh, and uh, I felt my job was to try to help them as much as I could. So did you feel like you had the coolest job in the world at that, that point? Yes. Better than the president or what? <laughs> well, I... Because the president is not inventing anything. They're just talking <laughs> on TV or something, right? I, yes. It's, it's, it, you're, I think we all have to work. 
uh, and that means doing things that other people need. Sometimes we're very lucky and we get to work on something we really enjoy. And those times are special. And they happen, you know, a few times in our life. But that was, which years are you talking about this lab that you built and the 10 years and all that stuff? When, which, when is that? 1990 to 2000. And then what happened after that? Uh, the work began to dry up. It became harder. The, the, it was, by that time, it was clear the United States was not going to be a player in, in, in flat panel displays, which was sad. Uh, and I did everything I could to try to... I worked for DARPA and other people trying very hard to get the United States to compete with Japan, but in the end we couldn't. And so once that transition happened, then all the research and development dried up. Uh, and so I went out to California to do startup companies and find other ways to use my creativity. Tech. Tech startups. Tech startups. You, you didn't like start Google or something like that, right? No, Facebook, no, no. Which one? Which one do you do? Uh, uh, <clears throat> first startup company was Sarif, uh, and then uh, second was Alien Technology, and then I found a third one called Intelliflex, and uh, worked for a fourth startup company called Awood. What did those four? What kind of products were they doing? Or uh, are they doing? Okay, Sarif was going to make displays. So we started a, a company to do that. It was funded heavily with the government. Uh, and then uh, uh, Alien was gonna make displays too, but changed his mind and made RFID. And we, it's, it still does that, so it's, that was a pretty big success. And then uh, Intelliflex makes long range RFID, uh, and Awood made RFID read, readers. So. Uh, and then after that, I started my own company, and so I, I formed Sourland Mountain, which uh, is, does patent consulting for some 70, 70 companies worldwide. To help them uh, turn their ideas into real stuff, is that what you do? Do some of that. I also, I also do a lot of litigation. Uh, I've uh, been asked to provide a serve as an expert witness in litigation. The, the Asian companies now fight with each other, so Japan is fighting with Taiwan, is fighting with Korea. And, China? And it would be now, but at the time, the battles were between those two, three countries, and so uh, that's what I, what I did. But you were saying it's sad that the U.S. didn't, do some, didn't become a player in the displays. Of course it's sad, but how about Europe? It doesn't, what does Europe do? They, they did worse than we did. Is this nothing? There's nothing. It's There's only nothing. it's only in Asia. There's Why no is there nothing? I thought there were creative people in Europe. The, the it's a very hard technology to master, and I think the I think uh, the Asians did a, a very good job. They were, they they wanted to do it more than we did, and and so they worked hard, and, and they had they had lots of patient they call it patient capital, and that's helped them a lot. So uh, in the future. It's going to be exciting, right? More and more stuff. Oh, it's exciting. I think this displays are exciting. I think the, what you're going to see in the next five to ten years are displays that look so good that people will not be able to distinguish between the display and reality. And it's never happened. And so that'll be a breakthrough. What TV do you have? Do you have OLED? I have an OLED backlight and an active matrix liquid crystal display from Sharp. Uh, OLED 70 backlight. Inch. Huh? OLED backlight. It, it's a, oh, excuse me, it's a LED backlight. LED, yeah, it's LED. organic. Inorganic, not organic. Yeah. So, so you got an LCD TV. I have an LCD TV. You don't want to get an OLED? One of those LG OLED TVs? I wouldn't mind. Uh, yeah. But I think liquid crystals, or excuse me, the, uh, liquid crystals can do higher levels of brightness and they can be blacker. If, you look, if, you're, if you're in a really dark room, then it doesn't matter as much. But if, you're, if there's ambient light in the room, then you want the screen to be as dark as possible so you don't wash out your blacks. And liquid crystals are brighter and they are uh, darker. So, I, so this is better for the HDR kind of stuff? 
Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. So I think what happened is that organic light emitting diodes, they, they were really exciting and they, they forced the liquid crystal industry to scramble and to do a better job. And having done that, I think they will have left a permanent mark on the industry. But right now, 99% of television displays are LCD. Very few of them are, are active matrix organic light emitting diodes. So uh, either will work. Uh, in a way, you won't care. As long as you have a wonderful looking image, you don't care whether it's liquid crystal or, or, uh, uh, or organic light emitting diode. What you do need, the, the revolution, you need high resolution so you can't see the pixels. You need uh, high dynamic range uh, with, with uh, dim, uh, dimming the backlight locally. And then you need better color gamut. Uh, you need to show all the colors that could be perceived by the human eye. Right now, television, NTSC television, you can only see about half the colors. The other half cannot be captured by print, by television, by camera, by any means at all. And that's about to change, and that's exciting. About to change thanks to the new HDR TVs, or what? It's an, it's, that's, that's high di dynamic range. It's part of it, but it's not all of it. What you also need is much purer primaries. All, all a liquid crystal can do is either let the light through or not. But if you don't have highly saturated light in the first place, then you can't create highly saturated images. So, so you... Is that what they're, they're upgrading, the latest upgrades to the LCD, the, uh, what do you call it, the... It's called quantum dot. Quantum dot. Yes, so that's, that's why the, they're doing that. That's the quantum dot, it's quantum making this dots. possible. Yes. You can get almost twice as many colors if you use quantum dots. And then you can also use multi-primaries. You don't have to just use three. You can use six or eight or whatever, and you can you can actually capture all colors that can be perceived by the human eye. The so primary exciting. is important. The primary makes the color more accurate, or well, if you kind of vision, uh, all colors can be shown in what they call a CIE diagram, and if you can the, the You'd like to be able to show all of those colors, and you can't now. You can only show about half of them, and so that's the the newest revolution is to is to show uh, almost twice as many colors as you can now. So, um, with your with your latest company, I imagine you're still looking at the latest labs out there, right? You visit and you get to see all this latest stuff that they're inventing. Yes. And so, how does that compare with the labs you had? Oh, the labs are much better, I think. How? What's different? Uh, well, they have they have uh, hundreds or thousands of people working in those laboratories, so they're hundreds of thousands. Hundreds or thousands. Oh, hundreds or thousands. Yeah, you were just like dozens, or I was just yeah, at most a dozen people at Sauerland yeah. Mountain. It, the laboratory I had at Sarnoff was bigger. It was probably about forty people. But there, there's maybe thousands of people, how did they all work together on the same kind of like goals and stuff? That's called a research laboratory, that's how you manage, you have to manage it. Uh, the uh, RC, uh, RCA Labs was a great research laboratory. It, uh, IBM had a great research laboratory, Xerox Park in California. There are a lot of great research centers, just no one wants to pay for them in the United States anymore. And uh, the system with patents and everything is great, or would it be better if everything was just like, uh, I don't know, some kind of open source thing where everybody could, um, I don't know, maybe China has another idea than patents, I don't know, like doing you, things differently. The you want to encourage progress if you, somehow. If you, if you want to encourage invention, then you have to give the inventors some chance to win. And if they don't have patents, then big companies will just squash all your new little startup companies. So you can't have startup companies without a viable patent system. Is it working well now or it could be improved? This whole patent thing? It, it works pretty well. It could always be improved. It changes every few years. Congress is always passing new laws. And all these different countries agree? Because you say they're fighting. Well, they're, they're, they agree on what the law should be. Uh, China mostly just ignores it. They just cheat. Uh, they cheat. 
Yeah. You could, there's negotiations between the United States and uh, China right now. Yeah. And one of the big issues there is uh, China cheats on patents, and they they uh, don't pay the the Americans billions of dollars for for things they've just stolen. And since China is winning anyway, they should play fair. You know, if, if you're losing the game, cheating isn't so bad. But if you're winning the game, it's sort of outrageous to cheat at the same time. It, it wouldn't be a problem for them to. Just pay something. They they have so much money, right? They have plenty of money. They could pay for the, the patents they infringe, and they could buy more American stuff for sure. They'd love to. They actually. almost have to. Otherwise, we won't be able to. because we won't be able to pay them back. Yeah. <laughs> we we got so much debt that they they can think they're rich, but if they don't allow us to uh, to make enough money, then then we won't be able to pay back the loans, and they'll lose anyway. So I'm sure they want to buy more American stuff. They have nothing against it. China has been starting when it was a weak country, and it almost needed. They felt they needed to cheat in order to catch up. Uh, China is now so big that there's no excuse for cheating anymore. China should be uh, following its own patent law and not cheating. But right. they, they have a long habit of cheating, and they'll have to change that. You go to China a lot? I do. Yeah. So you're giving them ideas for what they should do with the, all this stuff, or the patent stuff? I mean, I guess yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks okay, a lot. Okay. Take care.